Well, I hope everybody had a good break. Um, hopefully you got some sort of rest during that break. I got to work overtime, so I didn't get as much break as I wanted, which is fine. All right, so I went through the slides for today's lecture. As you can see, I prepared my little script as usual. Um, this lecture is 35 slides. It's a little absurd. Um, I am gonna go through it as best I can without the slides, because the slides just kept talking about things that are not necessarily important at this point. Um, however, what we're gonna talk about today is the next step in SQL. So, so far, you guys have experienced pulling records using select and adding some where clauses to filter down what you did. Uh, you did some aggregates to add up the totals, that kind of stuff. Now, as much fun as that is, realistically, the chances of you only ever using one table for a source of data is tiny. In the real world, uh, once you start dealing with a database, you will be dealing with a rather complex set of structures that have tables that are related to each other. Um, and the way you pull the data out is from multiple sources at once is called a join. So you're taking one table, you're joining it to another table. And how do you do the join? You go across points of commonality. If you recall from the first part of the term when we talked about foreign keys, that's a column whose values are basically have to exist in another table as a primary key. That's basically usually what you do a join with is that. Um, now, I did send out an announcement so you guys would have a copy of the database I'm using. Um, this database is actually really interesting if you ever take the time to explore it. It's very much out of date. But has anybody in here ever heard of a website called FlightAware? FlightAware is a really cool website. It lets you real-time track flights. If you know the flight number, you can actually see the plane delayed by five minutes where it was. It's not quite real time, it's off by five minutes for obvious reasons. Uh, if it's not obvious to you, well. Oh, no, 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 no. A flight aware tracks commercial flights. Um, that was just some guy on Twitter who, uh, who was extra clever. Um, so for a long time, FlightAware used to publish their info, all their information one year out of date. So as each calendar year would end, they published their information. So this database I gave you guys was actual real world airports, flights, airlines, actual destination and source airports, what kind of planes they flew on them, everything. It's all real data. It's just 10 years out of date because they've stopped publishing their, I guess they got tired of people asking questions about their data sets, which is because I have a copy of it, and I, you, so do you. Um, so this data set actually lets me pretty much cover every topic for today, except for one. Now, when we talk about join, there are two kinds of joins. Sorry, two styles of joins. Actually, careful. There's many kinds of join, two styles. There's something called the implicit join, and then what is basically the modern style of the joins. Implicit joins date back to basically 1970s, early 80s. The syntax was a boost. Um, vendor did it a little different, especially Oracle, because they still like doing things different. Uh, and on the way, the ANSI group said there has to be a standard way of doing joins, and they came out with the style of joins. So. This is the version I'm going to teach you guys is the modern version. It has advantages over the old one because it's easier to read because it is more obvious what it is you're doing. Um, there are supposedly no performance improvements. I've seen performance differences in large data sets. In small data sets, it doesn't make a difference. But in large data sets, I have seen improvements because uh, you're more explicit in how you're doing it. So, this is the only spot you're going to hear me ever. Um, when you, like I said, if you go Googling how to do it, 
old style of doing it. You'll know it doesn't look like a modern join. In actual fact, that style has slowly been being erased off the internet, thankfully. Um, they both work, it's just they're one's less acceptable now than, the, than it used to be. So without further ado, let's talk about um, what what is a join. So if we go select star from airports and you are not, there we go. And I run this. So this is something you guys have seen already before, standard select star, okay? However, what happens if you'll notice when you look at the data set that we have a country ID. We don't know what country that is. And if we want to know what country it is, we know looking through the database, there's a countries table, which has, you know, just the two columns. It's a list of countries. Now, if I want to pull out the name, let's go with the name of the airport, okay? Keep it simple. So now we know the name of the airport and actually it's the city because that's also, okay from the airport, but we also want to know what the, the join. So syntax starts with join. You tell it what name you want to join. And this is where data grip really shines because it actually knows the data structures you're playing with and it auto completes it for you. But realistically, you should really know, learn how to do it by hand. So, You really should learn the syntax because there will come a day where you have to do it and you're going to be using a tool like, I don't know, uh, SQL Developer for Oracle, which doesn't do any of these nice things for you. Um, so I'm going to connect airports. Okay, so here's the syntax for a join. You're basically saying, I want to grab records from airports. I want to join countries, and then you tell it, hey, this is how these two tables are related to each other. So you tell it what column they have in common. You'll notice the column names are different because they are work, except for one thing. This is where I'm going to be talking about um, the next item. You'll see a tiny little error message down here. And it's, you guys probably can't read it, but it says column name in field list is ambiguous. Okay, English skills. What does the word ambiguous mean? Yes, unclear. Why is it unclear? Because the airports have a column called name and countries has a column called name. Therefore, it says, you're being ambiguous, which name do you want? So you have to tell it what name you want, which as you'll notice down here, I have something called table prefixing as a thing I should talk about. So that's a good time to bring it up. So if I go um, airports.name and I try to run it, now we're back in business, but realistically, we're not really seeing a difference. However, let's go add countries.name. And now here's our airport, the city, and the country name. And that looks right, actually. There's Turkey, Vietnam, Saudi Arabia, Netherlands. Um, how many airports that are in this database? 8,107. Um, so this is nice and all. We are retrieving records. We're pulling data from more than one place. However, the fact that we're pulling back the name twice is a little awkward. Um, data grip is being very generous here because it's actually identifying down here when you look at it the table name dot column name. When you run this in Python or whatever programming language you happen to be using, it's not going to do that. It's still going to return name. So I'm going to be back to the point where I've got name twice. 
Remember, just before the break, I talked about aliases? Now you get to rename it. So at this point, I've got to join. It pulls data from two things. It's retrieving the country and giving it a new name, so it's unique. Column coming back. Um, and saying, I want information from it. So I'm going to connect. And by the way, you know, these are the keys I'm connecting across. You could picture this a bit like um, man, I'm going to age myself here. So once was a time when you wanted to play online games with your friends, you had to know their IP address. And how would you connect to them? You knew you punch in their IP address. Picture this being a case of you need to know what the address is of the country by the ID so you can actually get its name. Um, you're pointing it at something else. Um, now, but it's recording. I had a panic attack there for a second. Um, aliases can also play a part in this. Um, past just renamed columns. When you start having a lot of tables, your queries tend to get a little long. Because um, you'll notice, you know, here I said airports.name, countries.name. You can actually give tables aliases. And you'll notice now everything's going red. Actually, let me change that back. I want to keep um this put that here okay i'm gonna go airport's gonna get called name countries is gonna get called c just like that and this will do the exact same thing as it always did except we renamed all these tables so they have a shorter name um when you're dealing with really big table names it gets uh, like most actually have really short names. The years where the table name is 30 characters long. Why? Because that's just how the naming conventions ended up being. We got a table called customer orders and then so it's customer order products. And then it got it was customer order products shipping information. Right? So because it's there's a hierarchy of how it gets built up, the table names get really long. So suddenly, you know, you're typing in queries and you gotta type in these really long table names in front of 16 columns, you're like, yeah, bruh, that's not happening. You're gonna you can alias it so you could give it nice short names and just make life a little easier. There's no performance improvement. It's only there for your convenience. You use the full table name, please. So I tend to. That's just that's a me thing. I'm not a big fan of aliasing tables. I don't know why, but I've been doing this for heading on thirty years now, and my brain just doesn't like aliasing tables. It makes my makes my eyes water. Uh, I don't know why. Each people have their own thing, right? So with this, we can still. Use our typical clause, so errors that you've experienced, right? Uh, oh, with uh, where uh, country, uh, no, let's go c dot name, not dot slash dot name is equal to Canada. There you go. Now we got our Canadian airports. Joins work across with aggregates too. Whatever you could do without the join, you can do with this. So let's just say, I don't care about the, uh, I don't want to filter by country name, but I want to count a dot ID uh, by country. And I want to go group by C dot name, order, order by C dot name. 
and now it's counting the number of airports by country. Useful information, kind of, you know, but it's useful information. Um, you could use any of the aggregates. You could find out the max elevation of an airport, find out which airport's the highest, which one's the low, playing with these joins. Now, the other thing about joins is you're not limited to one. You can have as many joins as you want. So let's just say I'm going to go a little deeper. So I'm going to go select um, airlines, airlines.name from airlines. Fantastic. I got all my airlines. Okay. Now I'm going to, I want to find out what kind of planes they fly. So I'm actually going to pull up the diagram for this, just so you guys have it, just so you can see it. Uh, there it is. Oh, come on. Where'd you go? Here you are. Okay. It's a somewhat more complex database than the other ones because there's actual multiple references. But essentially, if I want to know what airplanes an, an airline flies, I got to go from the airline to the route because an airline operates a route, right? So Air Canada flies out of Ottawa going to Halifax. So Air Canada has an, a route or a route, depending how you want to pronounce it, from Ottawa to Halifax. But we want to know what plane they fly on that route. So then we go from the routes to the aircraft and then the, the route aircrafts and then the aircrafts here. Um, as you, that's your good old dissociative entity here. Um, so I'm gonna go uh, join routes and I'm just gonna let it finish it for me. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this up piece by piece. Actually, it's r.id. And I don't need that prefix. Okay. Because I want to make sure I'm actually building this properly. Okay. Now we got an airline. And we can see the root IDs that go with that airline. So now I'm going to go join in the root aircrafts on like that. All right, I'm mix matching, you know, uh, aliases and not. So now I'm going to go, I'm going to throw in this ID in here too, just to make sure that my, my query is building properly. Oops, I'm in the wrong spot. All right, so I know I'm still pulling data as I'm going. Right at this point, all I can do is assume I'm correct because there's just numbers, right? So now I'm going to go join aircrafts on root aircrafts ID to aircrafts, and I'm going to add in the aircrafts dot name and run that. Now we got our. If we want. We can now get rid of these two that we have going on in the middle. So we have a slightly cleaner look because those numbers don't really mean anything to anyone. That's just me testing. Um, and then I just want to know what they fly. So I'm going to make that distinct. And now I find out which aircrafts any given airline runs. Cool beans. You'll notice I didn't write the entire SQL statement in one go. Why? Anybody want to tell me why I didn't write it all in one go? Okay, how many of you write a program all in one go? You write the entire thing, you hit run, and it works on the first try. In my career, that's happened a total of four times, where I wrote like over 100 lines of code, and it ran the way it was supposed to. It doesn't happen, okay? So was I building it piece by piece? I was making sure that what I was working, then I a little bit, that's working. Because if you make, make in a big complex SQL statement, suddenly you'll go, huh, it's giving me an error message at this, but really the problem is probably before that, because SQL only tells you where it failed, 
not necessarily where it failed is not necessarily where the problem is. It's where it discovered there was a problem, and it might it's anywhere to basically the left of whatever you're doing. So I build up my SQL statements piece by piece so that if I add something new, I know it's whatever I just added in. Here I can throw in my aggregates. Again, I'll throw in an aggregate example again, just for fun. Um, I wish it wouldn't do that. Okay, I'm gonna go count the aircraft names, count the distinct aircraft names for each airline. And I'm going to group by airline name. And now I, I can tell you how many different kinds of planes each airline flies. So this outside of really complex queries is about as complex SQL will get for most of you. Yes, there's way more complicated stuff than this, but 90% of the time, this is about as complex as it will get. If you can wrap your brain around how the join statement works, life is good, okay? Now, so now I just finished talking about the just, well, joins. There's other kinds of joins. Earlier, remember I said that I had to be careful between the word kind and types. So we have something called the left and the right joins. Uh, airports dot name from airports join uh, routes dot on routes. You'll notice it's not able to do because it has multiple. Okay, so uh, you know what? I'm actually gonna go, in a second, I'm gonna actually use an aggregate for this. So essentially what I'm saying is, give me any airport that is a landing zone. So an airport, you know, there's a source airport, plane goes up, there's a destination airport, plane comes down. Usually, that's how it works. There are some cases where the routes actually are, there's only a source airport, the plane takes off and lands at the same place. Those are like tour, tour, you know, you see stuff like that mostly at like the Rockcliffe Airport or the Gatineau Airport. The Ottawa Airport, you don't tend to see a lot of planes that take off at the Ottawa Airport and land back at the Ottawa Airport. So, again, this is just a standard join. So I'm actually going to go uh, count airport, I cannot type today, ports.id. All right, and now it's got 64,000. Uh, because I don't know how to spell either. Okay, 3,000 airports, cool. So I was gonna say, I was gonna talk about the different styles of joins. We have something called a left join. And a right join. Do you know now if you were paying attention, you just noticed the number change. So we went from 3,275 to 1,107. Now, what does that mean? What's happening is it's saying, Select the distant count of airport IDs from airports, left join. So that means when you do a left join, it says, give me everything that is to the left of this in the query. In other words, give me everything from airport. And if you find any matches, give me stuff from the match. So if I am, let me just go, um, Airports.name, comma, 
roots.id. Okay, right now we have, it shows an airport name and an ID. Okay, there's one. Let's see if it's going to let me do what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay. You'll notice right here there's an ID and it's null. So what it's doing is it's saying, give me everything from airports and give me anything you match in routes. If, when you do a left join, if you don't find anything in the table to the right, because let me put it all on one line, okay? Left, right. So it's saying, give me everything from the airports because it's to the left of the join routes. So it's going to give me everything from airports. And if it does not find anything in routes, like whatever I asked here, it returns a null. So it's always going to give you all the airports. It'll give you a match on the routes if it has one. Now, some people will often ask, hey, why do you need such a strange type of query? All right. Picture yourselves, you're running Amazon. And Amazon has millions upon millions of posted. Every once in a while, they run a report to see what never sold. So they can delist products. So what they would do is go select star from products. And I'm being super simple here. It's really not that simple on Amazon land. But select star from products, join product order lines, whatever you want to call it. And you do a left join. And then suddenly you'll have every product they ever sold plus matching order lines. Again, that doesn't sound all that useful. However, what you can, you can go roots. Oops, where roots. ID is null. Suddenly, it will give me just the routes, just the airlines that are never used as a place for people to land. It sounds a little weird that, you know, there's literally airports and lots of airports. 4,339 airports that are never used as a landing space. Obviously, there's planes that take off in there, so something lands. Most of these are going to be airports that aren't really used, like, for commercial purposes. So, they're, um, like, for example, FedEx has a private airport. So does UPS in certain, and they're big uh, transshipment hubs. Um, that's what you'd use that for. Uh, so that's the left join. Anybody want to take a guess what the right join would do? Just the opposite. It would give me everything from roots that, and then only airports that match. The, the, the issue is though that if this is done right, uh, oops, let's take off the board. Um, so apparently there are some, this is give me all the routes. Oh, hang on. So if I go airports dot name is null. So here are the routes that are, that exist that don't match as a destination airport. So it's the opposite. So this would give us like that 4,000 and change the other way around. So. Left and right join are a very uh, special purpose. It's not something you use all the time. It's when you're trying to find out um, whether or not um, there's matching records in both tables. Like I, like I said, and a good example is you're trying to find products that never sold. So you list all the products doing a left join to order lines. And where the order line ID is null, that'll tell you which products never sold. Um, sometimes you'll have products that have a lot of different SKUs. Uh, how many of you have worked in retail? So for the two of you, you know what the word SKU stands for, or at least what it's used for. So sometimes when you buy things, it comes in many different flavors. And you'll have a different SKU for every flavor, right? So sometimes you'll have products that never sell. Um, Trying to come up with an example. 
Um, somebody decided to make them. This doesn't exist, but somebody decided to make a mouse that's like vomit yellow. Because somebody thought it was going to be a funny thing to do, and they discovered that it never sold. <laughs> Why? Why do you not want a vomit yellow mouse? Well, you know, I had to pick something gross to make a point. Okay, so that's left and right joins. Um, the slides discuss this a little bit more detail. Actual fact, the hybrid that talks about joins actually does a better job of it. Um, it uses um, Venn diagrams, which is wrong. Uh, you should never use Venn diagrams to discuss joins, but it's the common way to discuss it anyways, so there it is. Um, it's FaceTime. Now, the next two, um, okay, so natural joins. Natural joins are joins for lazy people. So I'm gonna go select star from airports, join countries, okay? And, there you go, SQL. Oh, cause I got from twice, from, from. Look at that, it worked. Magic. But it didn't work. I'm pretty sure that uh, this airport, actually hang on there, like that. Um, so I just discovered that MySQL does not do what it does other data, I mean, MariaDB doesn't do what MySQL does. Just learn something. Um, so I was trying to demonstrate a natural join to you and that didn't go well. It just demonstrated the next example instead. So a natural join is when you do the join statement, but you don't tell it what the on clause is. What every other database server will do at this point is go, hey, what fields do we have that are in common? And it goes, oh, countries has an ID column and airports has an ID column. That must be what we're gonna join on. And it usually tries to join on that. So the natural join will look for two columns that have the same name and use that as your join source. So in this case, it could have tried to join across the ID. It might've tried to join across the name. It actually probably tried to join across both of those, because it, they're both there, so it's thinking they must be a compound key. Let's use both of them on both sides. Here's Dan's pro tip. Never use natural joins. Why? You're assuming that the computer is gonna do what you want it to do. And you know what they say when you assume, right? Make an ass out of you and me. A-S-S-U-M-E. Never assume with computers because it'll blow up in your face. Always be as explicit as you can be. Now, since my example of a natural join didn't work the way it's supposed to work, I was gonna discuss cross joins or Cartesian joins. And cross joins and Cartesian joins um, are interesting. How many of you remember ma uh, matrices from high school math? Vaguely, a matrix, that ring a bell? Matrix transformation, linear algebra, anybody? Okay. Yes, I had to take it in high school and I really hated every minute of it. So if you enjoyed it, it's good for you. I really didn't like math. Uh, and I work in computers, go figure. Um, so a Cartesian join, I am gonna create a new database. Uh, Cartesian, use Cartesian, create table, uh, face value. Uh, the name, um, I'm, be, I'm being super lazy with this. 
Obviously, I didn't prepare this before class because I really should have, but I did not. Um, That'll, that'll make the point. Insert into suite. Uh, values. Okay. D. S. H. Diamond speed heart. Clubs. Okay, let's see if I actually got, if I wrote all this code correctly. Run. Oh, look at that. I got it right on the first try. Here I am saying don't ever write all your code in one try. Um, all right. So what a Cartesian do, join does is it joins everything to everything else. So let's go select star from um, suite, join, face value. Uh, well, there it is trying to get to get smart and try to do a natural join for me. All right, I'm going to run this. And what do we get? We get a deck of cards. So I literally have D1, D2, D3, S1, S2, S3, H1, H2, H3, C1, C2, C3. It's basically creating a matrix of all the combination of possible values. It's a cross join, also known as a Cartesian join. Um, Twenty-eight years I've been doing this. I've never used it. Just saying. Obviously, somebody needed it because they created this functionality. But it's something I personally have never used. It's a cute trick. Um, now, if you're working in the scientific community and you're dealing with scientific values, then your matrices will make sense because you may need to know the combination of all the possible parameters for a thing so you can actually use a Cartesian join to build up all the combination of every parameter. So then you can run that through a system to find out what happens when you flip, you know, switch one, switch two, switch one, switch three, switch one, switch four back and forth until you have every combination of possible switches and you can just set it up that way. <clears throat> okay. So um so that was the last big item uh of this lecture. Um I'm done a little early um which is rare at least for this topic. Uh so let's save this because I don't want to lose my changes. Now, like I said, the important one you really need to learn in all of this, and I'm going to switch this back to my flight DB so everything stops being angry, is basically this. Learning how to join many tables. Joining two tables is good. That will actually handle lots of situations for you. But once you realize that one table two tables, 10 tables, it doesn't make a difference. And the performance is negligible. Um, now, let me explain some of the perks of the modern join syntax, as opposed to the old style um, implicit join. With the implicit join, just, just so you know what it looks like, I'll actually put one in here. So let's go. I'm gonna grab this, I'm gonna go copy, paste. This is an implicit join. This is the old way of doing it. Now the implicit join 
you could not do left joins. You couldn't do right joins. You couldn't do natural joins. You couldn't do, well, Cartesian joins would work. Um, except if you were an Oracle, because Oracle had special syntax. The, yeah. You had the plus, or you could, there's, they also had one with an asterisk here, and it was terrible. Because you read this big long SQL statement, and you never realize you had a left join in the middle because you missed one character. So the explicit way of writing it is much, much better. Um, so what's the difference between this and this? In this small database, there is no difference. In a very large data set, there'll be a small performance boost from this syntax. Because SQL is ex executed left to right. So by what does that mean? Basically put, this is left, semicolon is right. And it literally reads a command from left to right. So what's happening here is it's saying, oh, I want to filter on this from these two tables. And at this point, it starts reading records from both tables into memory. Once it's done reading tables into memory, it then does the where. After it's finished going through the tables, and then it starts, you know, doing the matches. With this, it'll go, oh, I want to grab from here. Oh, we're going to join on this. So then as it's reading airports, it's only going to read stuff from countries that matches. So it's doing less retrieval. It's a very minor performance boost. Yes. Yep. Okay, so you came across an example that used the implicit style join? I'm not sure what you mean. I'd actually have to see what you're talking about because I have no idea. So, you know, feel free to send it to me. So send me the example because I'm really not sure what you're saying. Um, I'm having a hard time visualizing it. Not, you're, I'm not saying you're not explaining it right. I'm just not visualizing what you're saying. <laughs> okay. Um, so this has a big performance boost. Like, by big, I'm talking like 2-3%. I know 2-3% doesn't sound big to everybody in this room, but 2-3% to a computer is a lot. Uh, there's other things you can do. Also, um, if you want, you can actually go put an and clause as if this part of the where. So you go and um, country dot name is equal to Canada. Um, I'm not even going to leave this in the in the sample, and that works. It has a zero performance increase. Unless you're working with IBM DB2. So it's just one of those things, depending what database engine you're using, some of the stranger syntax that you can use with SQL will give you performance boosts on one platform and nothing on the other. Um, this is slightly frowned upon, actually, because you are um, mismatching concepts. You're mismatching a join and a filter as part of the join. Realistically, you want to do the join and then you want to filter as part of the where clause so that it's obvious that you're filtering. Um, yes, theoretically, this has been known to give slight performance boosts in specific database platforms. The, the slight performance boost is so minuscule that you'll never ever actually notice it. Um, the only reason why IBM actually put it into DB2 is DB2 is used on mainframes. And when who uses mainframes? Banks. And apparently uh, the CRA and the CBSA, just so you know. So the Canada Tax Agency and the Border Services also have mainframes. I just found out uh, <laughs> recently. Um, not a lot of people use mainframes. It's when you're talking about billions of rows of data that needs to be 
traversed quickly, that's where that particular syntax will give you a slight performance increase. In systems that most of us in this room will use, just to be completely honest, you're probably never going to need to worry about, you know, that minus skill. If you're working in it with a database with billions of rows, power to you. Um, millions of rows is intimidating enough. Okay, so uh, that's that. I'm finished right on time. Um, hybrids have been released. Labs have been released. Uh, lab 5 is not due till Sunday, so no panic on that. It's, it is a chunky lab. Um, continue as you should. Uh, the announcement will be up. The, re the rip will be up later tonight, I hope. Hopefully nothing goes wrong with my recording, and it's all good. Knock on wood.